13 and 314 for a shooting at Century Theaters. They're saying somebody is shooting in the auditorium. Roger, keep your fires west of the smoke. It's red hot. I had an officer hit. Send me the world. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. Welcome to Tactical Tangents. Welcome back to Tactical Tangents. This is Mike. This episode is brought to you by Loa Boots. Start your day off on the right foot with footwear that was designed for those who stand relentlessly in the face of adversity. I wear Loa every single day for miles on canine searches and for hours on tactical operations and inclement weather. No matter what, Loa keeps me moving. Whether you run, hike, hunt, or fight on the streets or out in the woods, Loa has the gear you need to help you conquer whatever challenges you face. Go check out their new line of trail running shoes at Loa Boots, L-O-W-A Boots.com and get outside for some fresh air and daylight. Loa, for those who know where they're going and won't stop until they get there. And this is Jim. This episode is also brought to you by Manisex. We've talked a lot about the tactical fantasy on this podcast and one of the quickest ways to break your tactical fantasies and actually improve your, your performance is by getting real feedback. One of the ways you can do that is with Manisex. You're not going to get better at shooting on your own. You need practice, data, and coaching. And you need to make the most of your ammo with good live and dry fire training. Manus is a family of training devices that tracks you while you train. It times and tracks everything you do in a drill and coaches you as you go. It is indispensable to taking your shooting to the next level. Go find them on manusx.com. All right, gather around, kids. I'm going to tell you, this, tell you a story, a little flying story. I wasn't part of this. Uh, thank goodness. This is actually before my time back in 1972. And if he was uh, tell, if it was something he was involved with, it'd start with something like "There I was." No shit, so, there I was. So there I was, balls deep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is in the year of our Lord, 1972. Uh, this is one of the big classic aircraft mishap stories that drove a whole bunch of changes in the airline industry, in the military, all that stuff. And this is Eastern Flight 401. It was a Lockheed L-1011, which you don't see very often anymore. It looks a little bit like a DC-10. It has a, an engine up in the tail. It took off from New York on Friday, December 29th. 1972 at 2120 local, so nighttime. <laughs> Had 163 passengers, 13 crew members, and it was quite routine up until 2332 local. So, whatever that is, two, two hours later. Two hours into the flight, yep. Yeah, I, I can't math. That's a thing we're going to talk about in this episode. Um, when the airplane began its approach into Miami, that's actually a pretty quick flight, looking at it. Uh, after lowering the gear, the co-pilot, uh, named Stock Still, you might hear me reference him uh, throughout this story, uh, noticed, rightly, that the landing gear indicator, so the little like, uh, the little light tells you that your landing gear is down and locked and good, uh, one of the lights was out. So a green light identifying the nose gear was properly locked in the down position had not illuminated. This was later discovered to be because it was burnt out. So that, that happens, lights burn out, and uh, but you have to honor the light. That's a rule. So if you don't have positive indication that you've got safe gear, you have to do something about that, understandably. Uh, the landing gear, there's, there's a lot you can do about landing gear malfunctions. You can, there's like overrides and uh, ways you can manually lower, you know, hydraulic secondary systems, that kind of thing. Go down and turn the a pilot, crank, shit like that. Yeah. In some cases, literally turn like, it literally, or you let yeah. gravity do it. Like you jerk the, jerk the controls and let the gravity swing it down, that kind of thing. The pilots cycled the landing gear up and down and still couldn't get the light because the light bulb was burnt out. The captain was working the radio, flying the plane, told the tower that they were going to have to discontinue their approach and go into holding. That's very normal troubleshooting for gear issues. The first thing you do, stop, smoke a lucky, figure things out, open up the manual, go through all those procedures. So they did that. The approach controller cleared the flight to climb to 2,000 feet, which is pretty low, and then hold west of Miami over the Everglades. The cockpit crew uh, took out the little light assembly. The second officer, so the flight engineer, uh, like a, a second co-pilot, 
uh, his name is Repo or Repo, uh, was sent down underneath the flight deck to check like through a porthole to make sure the landing gear was actually down. And about a minute, 50 seconds, if you want to get real detailed, after they reached their assigned altitude of 2,000 feet, the captain told the first officer to put the plane on autopilot. Generally speaking, that's a smart thing. Hey, we're busy. We're going to be looking at the manuals and, and doing the checklist. Go on autopilot. And remember, this was 1972. Autopilots weren't great in 1972. Autopilots in 2024 aren't always great either. <laughs> They're a lot better, but... Uh, Planes do not fly themselves the way many people think they do. And in 1972, we weren't doing, like, GPS and stuff like that like we are now. I mean, just wrap your head around. This was 50 years ago. <laughs> I mean, it's a yeah. long time ago. Uh, but, you know, generally speaking, there was, like, an altitude hold function. You could tell the plane, I want to fly 2,000 feet, and it would try to get you to 2,000 feet. Or hold right? a heading, something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, and And take some of that burden of flying the plane off of you, which is the whole point. For the next 80 seconds, the airplane maintained level flight. Good job, autopilot. <laughs> you're, you're doing great, bud. <laughs> and, uh, and then it started to drop. It dropped 100 feet and then flew two, three more minutes and then started just kind of slowly settling. Uh, so gradually that no one seemed to notice. Right, the gauges weren't moving real fast, which is typically a thing that would kind of catch your attention. So the crew didn't perceive that change. In the next 70 seconds, the plane lost 250 feet. And that was enough to trigger a chime whose job was to get the crew's attention. But the chime, I guess, it was louder back in the back, uh, the engineer station, the, that second co-pilot type station. And if anyone heard it, they didn't acknowledge it. Nobody said, ooh, what is that? And possibly because he was the guy that went down to look at the gear itself, I think Correct. is how I understood it, right? Correct. So the engineer had gone below. And there's no indication in the cockpit voice recorder that they had heard it. Another 50 seconds goes by. And by that time, the plane was at about 1,000 feet. So it had lost 1,000 feet. As stock still started another turn, he noticed, hey, something's up. And the conversation from the cockpit voice recorder, the co-pilot said, we did something to the altitude. The pilot said, what? The co-pilot said, we're still at 2,000 feet, right? And then the pilot said, hey, what's happening here? Ten seconds later, the jet crashed. It happened, you know, th this slow insidious issue uh, developed into about 10 seconds worth of emergency and then a crash. Uh, and it crashed 19 miles west of the runway. A otherwise perfectly good airplane with perfectly fine landing gear. And one burnt out light bulb. The plane was traveling 197 knots when it hit the ground. Uh, it was mid-turn, so the left wingtip hit the, uh, the surface of the Everglades first. Taking out the left engine, left landing gear. And uh, cut through the sawgrass of the Everglades. And fortunately, they were over the Everglades. That's actually probably what saved anyone who survived was the fact that they were over kind of marshy territory. Uh, the plane broke up. There were 101 fatalities and 75 injuries. Rough night. The National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, which investigates crashes, declared... I have to put on my NTSB voice... The failure of the flight crew to monitor the flight instruments during the final four minutes of flight and to detect an unexpected descent soon enough to prevent impact with the ground, preoccupation with a malfunction of the nose landing gear position indicating system distracted the crew's attention from the instruments and allowed the descent to go unnoticed. In modern speak, we would call that causal factor channelized attention. Right, They had a lot of attention on the thing that didn't matter. All three crew members were looking at basically at a burnt out light bulb and nobody was flying the plane. So what this example illustrates for us, and there's a lot of illustrations of this, we've talked a lot about on this show even. We talk about like human error, pilot error, decision making, all of that. 
And this in particular is a good example that shows that your attention is limited, valuable, and fallible. People are imperfect, right? Our memory, our perception, and the amount of attention, the amount of attention that we think we have is not as good as we give it credit for. In a lot of cases, we are blind in ways that we don't even realize. You might think you're really good at texting and driving, but I'm, <laughs> I can assure you, and I say this <laughs> transparently as someone who is notoriously bad about texting and driving, I admit that, <laughs> but it's not because I think I'm some pro. It's just one of those like luck is not a tactic kind of things, right? Um, in terms of decision making, if you think of your brain like a computer, there are inputs that run through the machine and then there are outputs. And the good or the bad decisions on the other end of that machine are only as good as the information that we provide. So shit in, shit out, right? And when it comes to attention and perception and what you see, right? When we talk about OODA loop, we always say like, it's not just what you see, it's where you look. It's not about the information that you keep. It's also the information that you discard. This is very much a part of that. We are only as good as the information that we provide ourselves to make decisions with. Yeah. So kind of the, the crux of this episode is that what you pay attention to matters and how wide you spread your attention, your focus matters. Lots of things are competing for your attention. In fact, they are designed to fight for your attention. That might be dings in the cockpit or the whoop, whoop, pull up. That might be your radio. That might be your cell phone. It could be lots of things. And they're all meant to get your attention. And life, your life experience is the sum total of the things you pay attention to. So let's be real thoughtful about what we actually pay attention to. Yeah, at the end of the day, a lot of the jobs that we talk about on this show... EMS, fire service, law enforcement, aviation, military stuff relies heavily on those human factors, right? Like there's a human, we talk about like a guy on a SWAT team, right? It's all, it's not about the gear. It's about the guy or the gal behind it, right? The problem is that our brains can play a lot of subconscious tricks on us in terms yeah, like of- like that guy or gal might be playing Candy Crush when they need to be behind the scope. That is. That's true. Right? Like, end of the day, that's the kind of thing we're seeing. And and I'd love to be like, it's these darn millennials, except I think I am one of them. <laughs> or these darn Gen Zers or these darn Gen Alphaers. But, like, we are conditioned to be ADHD and, like, not in a good way. <laughs> well, right. right. And so that's the thing is in terms of perception and attention, the way our brains are wired, that isn't just to fuck with us. And, and honestly, in a lot of ways, it's actually about survival. If you think about perceptual distortions and lethal force account encounters, auditory exclusion, um, tunnel vision, visual clarity, slowing of time, those time distortions kind of things, that's evolution trying to help us filter the things in our environment that are trying to kill us. That whole sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response that we have in our ape brain is intended to help us survive. But like any other machine or computer on the planet, there are glitches, right? We live in a complex world and it is not 100%. We just can't assume it will be 100%. And also evolution, when a lot of those things were programmed into our brain, that happened thousands of years ago when like saber tooth tigers were chasing us down or whatever. That is not the same, that's, not the same thing anymore, right? But we still have some of those behaviors. And fundamentally, our bandwidth, our brains have limited bandwidth. We live in that complex world. We have to make a lot of decisions. And because of that, we have executive function. We have some capacity or ability to use logic and reason to make decisions, right? We have short-term memory. Those things help us make decisions. We can say like, mm, I can weigh the alternatives, consider my options, like pros and cons. But we also have the subconscious and emotional side of our brain. 
And that's where a lot of those primitive behaviors live, to include things like habits and patterns and those perceptual distortions. That primitive emotional subconscious side of our brain helps us in a lot of ways. It helps us recognize patterns before the cognitive side of our brain is ready to deal with it, right? Before we realize it, sometimes our emotions will trigger that. And that's a whole other topic for a whole other day, but it can help us in a lot of ways. It speeds, speeds things up in a lot of ways. It lets us do a lot of stuff in the background, which is nice. There are some tasks and processes and just, you know, um, perceptions that can happen in the background. Think about one of the examples when I talk about this sort of thing is when you first learn how to drive a car. And if you're like 15 and a half, 16, you get your permit, take driver's ed, whatever. And, and you sit in the car in the driveway in the first time and you got like your dad or a driving instructor or someone, mom, whatever, sitting next to you. And you're like, all right, I'm gonna buckle my seatbelt, like check my mirrors, got my left mirror. You know, like nowadays, Kids these days just like adjust their mirrors. Like when Jim and I were kids, it was like, okay, bring it in a little bit more. No, out, no, too far. Pat, back out, back out. No, up. Nope, that's too much. Bring it down a little bit, down more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Too far, go back up. But you adjust your mirrors, right? You figure everything out. And then while you're driving, it's like 10 and two or nine and three, whatever you were taught, right? You have your hands on the wheel, you're focused, you're upright, you're paying attention. Everything is very, like the cognitive load is really, really high. And it was interesting, you know, fast forward, right? Nowadays, you learn how to drive and you're not looking at the road so much and trying to think about every move. You're doing a lot of that stuff in the background. You're watching light cycle. You're anticipating the actions of other drivers. You're eating a burrito, steering with your knee, talking on the phone, doing all kinds of other shit other than focusing on the task at hand, the cognitive load feels a lot less. And that is because there are parts of that that you can process automatically, right? You can process the light cycling. You can process your directions and just where you're supposed to turn and where you're going, your route, if it's a familiar route. That wasn't always the case. When you were a new driver, that was not always the case. And I got to experience this in a new way when I started learning how to fly manual drones with Brink they were a lot harder to fly. And guys would like be talking to me and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Less of that. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm trying to, yep. trying to do this. Um, but over time, you start to learn and condition some of that and it can happen in the background. So our brains help us in a lot of ways, but they can also trick us in a lot of ways. And there's some tricky little things about perception and attention that I think are worth noticing. And I'll explain why kind of as we go. One of them is a thing called the DRM paradigm. DRM is a set of initials for the people that, that did this experiment. And it was an experiment in which they took a list of words and they asked participants to try to memorize or remember as many words as they could. One of them in particular was a list of words that were like doze, slumber, dream, bed, night, moon. It was all stuff that was related to sleep, but the word sleep was not on the list. And when they did this study, they asked a bunch of people like, hey, try to remember, commit as many of these words as you can to memory. And if you, you know, if you don't remember them all, that's okay, but try to write down as many as you could. And more than something like 40% of people remembered the word sleep being on the list and it wasn't actually there. And what it illustrates, and there's several lists, there's different lists, that's just one of them. And what it illustrates is that our brains rely on patterns, right? It, it associates sleep with the things on that list. And for whatever reason, our minds will fill in the blanks. And if you think about like an officer in a lethal force encounter who perceives a certain thing to be true, and there's a discrepancy in the video that it shows that that wasn't what happened but that's how they perceived it to happen. Well, it could be because the, the brain is filling in pieces of that, right? So that's one of them, the DRM paradigm. There's another really famous experiment. Um, there's actually a whole book called The Invisible Gorilla. And it's like something about like ways that our minds deceive us or something like that. But if you Google The Invisible Gorilla, you'll come across an experiment. That was, that was conducted by a couple guys. And they later wrote a book that talked about a whole bunch of different 
illusions that are, you know, ways that our brains play tricks on us. In this particular experiment that's that the title is based off of, they asked a group of participants to count the number of times that a basketball was passed between people wearing, there was like a group of people, some were wearing black shirts, some were wearing white shirts. They're like, count how many times the people in whatever shirt are passing the ball. And during the experiment, it goes on for a few minutes, right? And they're passing the ball. And at the end of it, they're like, okay, how many times did the people in whatever color pass the ball? And they're like, oh, you know, 15 or 34 times or whatever it was. And they're like, did you notice anything unusual? And they're like, no. And they go, did you see the gorilla? <laughs> because during the video, during the experiment, while the people are passing the balls back and forth, there's a guy in a gorilla costume that walks out into the Spoiler middle of the room. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. And beats his chest and he walks out. And it's plain as day if you know it's there, but only about half of the people noticed the gorilla in the middle of the room while they were counting the balls. This was a good example that talked about how selective attention or inattentional blindness, the things that we're paying attention to will make us blind to other things in our environment. What's interesting is a follow-up to that experiment or kind of a, a, a later um, edition of that experiment had to do with a law enforcement encounter in which a group of people, a group of officers, I think in Boston, were chasing a guy that was involved in a shooting, some gangbanger that, you know, and there were some plainclothes officers that got involved in this chase that one of them got like misidentified, like mistaken as the suspect. And a group of cops like grabbed the dude and ended up like beating him up. This happened in like the early mid 90s, something like that. And one of the officers that essentially went right by this episode where the plainclothes dude was getting the shit kicked out of him, apparently, because there was an investigation and ultimately criminal charges against these dudes. Not only for excessive force, but also like they didn't have the right guy, <laughs> right? One of the officers that was involved who went right by the gaggle of cops kicking the shit out of this dude claimed that he saw the suspect, the actual suspect, jump the fence as he was running and he was chasing the dude. And ultimately what ended up happening was he ran right past this gaggle of cops kicking the shit out of this plainclothes officer. So after the investigation, he gets charged criminally with things like perjury, obstruction of justice. And essentially the narrative is there's no way that he ran right by that and didn't see it. He's lying. He's just trying to cover up for his buddies. That's the narrative. Now, if you read this book and you read the story that they talk about this, they acknowledge that that could be true. 100%, the guy could have seen it and was like, I'm not taking part of that and just kept going and stuck to his guns. He maintained that he didn't see what was happening. That being said, these guys that were that did versions of this invisible gorilla experiment conducted another experiment where they set up a task where people were supposed to run after a person in the experiment who was going to tap their head. And they were asked to either not count the times they tap their head or count the times they tap their head or count like when both hands tap the head, something like that. They gave different levels of load to include no load at all, not asking them to count. And while they were doing this experiment, about eight meters off the path of the run was a group of people fighting or simulated fighting, right? And, and they found, they illustrated in this study that it is possible that while they're watching a person and chasing after them under some cognitive load, that it is possible that people did not notice the, the, the fight, right? So again, it's just an example of this inattentional blindness, right? Or selective attention. We pay attention to the things that we think we need to pay attention to. That can help or hurt us. And one thing I would highlight from this is it doesn't take much. It takes way less distraction than people think it takes in order to get you to miss the gorilla or all the other things happening. Yeah, it's not like, I mean, if you were asked to participate in the invisible gorilla 
study. I'm like, hey, Jim, all right, I'm going to put you in front of the screen, and I want you to count the number of times. Like, you know I'm testing you, right? Oh, you can even tell someone there's going to be a gorilla, and they'll still miss it. True. That's how that's how easy it is to overwhelm someone's, you know, sensory uh, capacity. Yeah. Um, a- another place that's actually is seen a lot, there's a thing called change blindness, where – Certain things about the environment can change and people not notice, right? And and the whole point of all of this is to ultimately say that like, well, I don't remember that happening or I didn't see that happening. That doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And this is something that like with body-worn cameras, this was a learning curve, right? Cameras came out and people were like, he's lying. He fabricated that information, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, no, the camera captures it. I can rewind, fast forward, go frame by frame, pause, start, reset. Like you don't, that's real life isn't like that, right? And so you have to like be able to explain that and acknowledge that, right? There's another thing called change blindness that also is related to this where uh, there's actually a list. If you Google this, you can find examples of this in like movies and TV shows where in the middle of a scene, uh, an actor or something about the environment or the set will be different from one shot to the next, like within the middle of the scene, because they might've started, they might've recorded one part of it and then like yeah. done an edit or a cut, or maybe they picked up where they left. guy's got sunglasses on his head and then suddenly doesn't. That yeah. Kind of or thing. they're wearing yeah. a different color shirt or they placed a, a soda in front of one person instead of the other or the background, like the tablecloth was a different color. There's a bunch of stuff about this. And that stuff happens in movies and TV shows pretty fairly frequently. And people never notice, right? And like in hindsight, you can sit there and talk to someone about it and be like, oh, there's no way I wouldn't notice that. But but you would is the thing. And the last place where this really falls into play, and another example, it has to do with eyewitness testimony. There's a an organization out there that's tracking the number of times that people get exonerated from wrongful convictions, right? And from something like 1989 to 2020, there were, this, this organization tracked 375 examples of convictions that were later exonerated with DNA evidence, right? DNA evidence takes a long time. Sometimes it doesn't get run. Certainly in, you know, 80s and 90s, it wasn't much of a thing as it is now. But over the course of that 31 years, they looked at 375 convictions that were exonerated by DNA evidence, and they found that 61% of those convictions relied on eyewitness testimony, Eyewitness testimony played a significant role in those cases, meaning that someone got up on the stand and said, like, that's the guy that did X, Y, and Z, that forensic evidence later after conviction determined that's impossible, that it was the guy. And it illustrates again, eyewitness testimony is not 100% reliable because human perception, memory, and attention is fallible. It is not perfect. And we have to wrap our head around those human elements to understand that in the jobs that we do, whether it's flying airplanes or catching bad guys, we are going to be imperfect, right? Those inputs and outputs are not going to be perfect. That's the reality that we live in. And it gets a lot more imperfect when you task overload or sensory overload or perception overload. Give someone more things than they can process, it gets much worse very fast. One of the biggest things that we do in nowadays to overload ourselves is smartphones. So, question for no, our audience. Oh, Jim. Yeah. I you know, I'm actually my perception and attention's perfect. It is naturally. <laughs> All right, guilty. <laughs> so, here's a question for our audience. Is it okay to play a game on your phone while you're at work? Whatever you do, whatever you have, you, you drive semi-trucks whatever or it is you, you say you do here. Yeah, or you're a fighter pilot or you have, you're an airline dude or you're a, uh, you work at a grocery store, whatever it is you do. I would like to say in my context that n- no, it's not okay, okay to play a game on your phone at work, except, uh, 
my experience in my work is like it's hours and hours and hours of boredom punctuated by 10, 15 seconds of sheer terror. And a lot of what you're doing is you're trying to keep yourself awake. For, you're actually trying real. to keep yourself attentive, right? We, we do a lot of these like surveillance support operations and we're not yeah. doing the surveillance. Like we're the closer, right? Surveillance yeah. finds the guy and we go get the guy. But while surveillance is doing their thing and we're just sitting in the shadows, like waiting. Yeah. If you don't have a full phone battery, <laughs> like you're, <not, laughs> you're going to have a rough night. It's a real thing. <laughs> oh, and not just a rough night, night after night, after night, Sometimes, after night, yeah. you got to be able to keep yourself entertained, right? So smartphones are a thing we need to understand in the context of this whole concept of task saturation and attention saturation. Uh, they have changed the world in so many ways and in ways that we don't even fully comprehend. I walk around with a computer in my pocket that can call anywhere in the world, can send a video to anywhere in the world, can send a Snapchat to anywhere in the world can pull from all the data available on the internet, can generate an AI product for me, a picture or a movie or a poem, whatever, <laughs> right? I can buy Axe body spray through it. I can buy a car through it. I can bank through it. I can connect to my entire social network through it. Man, smartphones have done a lot. One big thing they have done is they have blurred the line between work and personal life. When I'm on travel, my wife can call me. When I'm with my wife, my boss can call me. And I sometimes have to make very consequential decisions on whether <laughs> I answer those calls or ignore them. Right? I don't really always get to ignore my wife, even when I have work stuff, unless I have serious work stuff, right? And I don't always get to ignore my boss, especially when I have serious wife stuff. It's date night and the boss is calling like, Ooh, come on guys. Uh, so consider that consider just like it, it impacts us in all kinds of ways. And specifically our ability to compartmentalize, I think has gone down quite a bit related, but separate. I recently visited a high school in California in the immediate wake of a critical incident. It wasn't a big, crazy incident, but it was, a, it was a legit critical incident. One thing I noticed immediately is that every single student and teacher was walking around with a cell phone in hand throughout this high school. Even during the critical incident, almost every single one of them contacted family or friends through their smartphones. People feel this overwhelming need to connect, even when connecting isn't going to improve their survival. Right. Calling for help makes sense, but that's not really what they were doing. What they were doing was calling to feel soothed. And I get it. I've, I've done the same. You, you want to tell your mom you're okay, but the thing is you need to make yourself okay. You need to do the things that are going to make sure that you remain okay. And the phone isn't one of those things. The thing about smartphones is that they very rarely are going to help you in the middle of of a critical event, but they're really good at sucking your attention and hitting you with that fix of dopamine. That's literally mm. how they're designed. Oh yeah. Especially like not just the phones themselves, but social media and all of that. They're absolutely your attention is the currency. And that's not, that's not like the old guy talking. That's, that's like established. That's just how it is. Yeah, that, that right. is established that you're trying to get like on a podcast, it's time of ear, right? How much of your day is spent listening to shit like this versus the radio or other people talking or whatever. Social media, no different. And everything, if you look at everything on your phone, it's more and more social media like group chats. When, when text messaging started, it wasn't group chats and group chats didn't have gifts, right? Like it's, your, your attention is the currency that's established. Yep. And, and tell you what, dopamine is a hell of a drug. That too. Yeah. It is a hell of a drug, but I need you to be smarter than the smartphone. And I need you to know when to set it down, when to leave it in your car, when to leverage it for tactical advantage, when to use it, get that camera up, get that 911 call up. 
communicate when you need to. But if you're playing Candy Crush when you need to be flying the plane or monitoring the nuclear weapons, man, we have a problem. <laughs> and that is the world we are in right now. And you you have to have the discipline to know when to put it down. So there's a lot that we can talk about in the context of of focus and distraction, compartmentalization, multitasking, and, and mostly what I want to talk about in this episode is the inputs. I want to talk about how you manage all the data going into your brain, but a core part of that is managing all the things you're, you're doing with those inputs. So multitasking, it's one of the things that's easy to say and hard to do. And most people, again, think they're much better at it than they actually are. I have a saying in a lot of the tactical experience that you need to be at least a little bit ADHD to do the job well. You need to be able to spread your attention and multitask and handle uh, sometimes conflicting inputs into your little OODA loop. You have to make sense of it all, prioritize your tasks, decide, and sometimes you have to do two things at once. You got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. If you're a pilot, you have to aviate, navigate, and communicate. If you're an army guy, you have to be able to shoot, move, and communicate. If you're a cop, you have to drive, chase a dude, clear an intersection, eat a donut, and talk on the radio all at once. <laughs> okay, Jim. Okay. Or if you're a firefighter, what do you do? Put water on the fire. I don't know. Put water on the fire. <laughs> <laughs> you see that fire right there? Why don't you put water on I'd like the you fire? To put water. On fire. <laughs> the problem is that most people really do suck at multitasking, and they don't even know how bad they suck at multitasking. It's like that that um, what's that movie where Bruce Willis he's dead and he doesn't even know he's dead. It's like that. <laughs> yeah, multitasking. There there is plenty of research on it, and people talk about like the need to multitask and how they multitask and all those things. And the research is is as I understand it, like pretty clear that oh yeah you can't really multitask and give full it like by definition you're not giving full attention to one thing right like that is fundamentally what multitasking means is you are dividing your attention and if you dive into some of the research on multitasking there are two types there is dual tasking where you're trying to do multiple things at the same time and you can only monitor so many inputs and you're not going to be able to do all of those very well, right? When you look at the research that talks about dual tasking, they usually limit it to two, to two tasks, right? Something like driving and talking on the phone or shooting and moving or, you know, something that there are, there's usually only two. And it's because if you look at like the way your brain anatomically works, you you can kind of do two things at once, right? You can talk on the phone and drive a car on some level and be all right. Well, I can. Those other drivers can't. Right, obviously. Right. Obviously. But there are still those studies that show that if you are driving and talking on the phone at the same time, a collision is four times more likely. So there is still some – your performance is still going to be degraded on both fronts. You're not giving as much attention to – the conversation as you think you are, and you're not giving as much attention to driving. Now, the, the thing is, is like sometimes your 80% or 60% might be enough to get you by until, you know, the kid chases the ball into the street in front of you or something like that. So dual tasking, trying to do two things literally at the same time is one thing. And if you think about even like field sobriety tests for impaired driving investigations, those are designed to measure divided attention, right? Because driving is a divided attention task. You have to physically control the car and mentally process things. You are doing two different things at once. So we talked about like, you can only really do two. Well, there are those two, right? Driving is a divided attention task. That's what we're measuring there. So dual tasking is one type of multitasking. The other one is task switching. And the best way that I've heard this illustrated or described is if you're watching a, a, a TV show and you're trying to also watch another TV show and you change the channel back and forth, 
trying to keep up with both. And you might generally follow the plot line. You might have the gist of it, right? But when you change the channel and watch the other, you are missing whatever is occurring on the previous channel. You cannot watch both at the same time. So you're just trying to bounce back and forth. And that will slow you down and it will increase the odds of errors. So again, multitasking is a thing, right? But you're probably not as good as you think. And no matter what, even if you are better at it than others, there is some degraded performance in terms of errors and time. I think that's a good way of putting it, right? You can dual task maybe a little. You can switch between tasks maybe a little. Uh, so where does that bring us? Like, you just consciously say, I'm only going to do one thing at once forever. Like, that that doesn't make you really useful. You got to be able to function. You have to walk and chew gum. It's just one of those things, right? So what I want you to do is think about how you do that and be uh, conscious of it and decisive about it. And the way you do that is skills, task management, and recognizing task saturation. Task saturation is when you have too much to do, the things you have to do are too hard, and there are pressures on you uh, on what's going to be your leading task. And it will get you improper task uh, prioritization to the point where you're just not doing anything useful at all. You become a lump, a lieutenant under mental pressure. And where I know this best is flying, right? Flying's my jam. And I love it. And I've always saw myself, right, as the pilots in the movies. And, uh, you know, I can I can do all the things because I believe in myself. And it turns out flying is actually really hard and really um, cognitively ta taxing. And a very much a combination of mental and physical skill. And it is very much a game of task management. Task management is the skill of sorting out both what you pay attention to in order to build this complete situational awareness picture, or at least as complete as you can make it, and then deciding what to do with your hands and your feet and your mouth <laughs> in order to do <laughs> so to all the things that need doing in order to fly the plane in this case. But that's also true for cop stuff, right? Mike has to handle a dog, drive a car, chase a guy, possibly handle a gun, possibly handle less lethal, talk to that guy, uh, talk on the radio, and like he doesn't get to drop all that. Okay, so you, you got to be able to do it. And when I talk about all this stuff you have to do, you know, it, all the inputs to all the outputs, that hopefully sounds familiar because it is a type of OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, act cycle. When you start flying, it can seem pretty overwhelming. <laughs> In fact, even when you're very experienced flying, sometimes it gets overwhelming. You have to read and interpret all the gauges, and goodness, there's a lot of gauges. And you have to read a checklist, and reading is hard. And do all the things on the checklist, and fly the plane. And as soon as you like get on altitude, your airspeed is wrong. And once you fix your airspeed, you're going off course because your plane's getting blown in the wind. So once you do the mental math to come up with a good wind-corrected heading, you're 100 feet high and climbing. And now your instructor is yelling at you and you have to answer them and sort out your feelings about it. Each thing that you're doing takes all of your attention and you are task-saturated. In fact, in many cases early on in flying, you're beyond task-saturated. You're that lump. You're meat in the seat. And once you get all that under control and you can do it divided attention, sort of like driving, right? Like once you get used to driving, you can eat a burrito and drive and you can fly that plane without putting a hundred percent of your focus on that stuff. You know what we do in the military? We move you on to a more complicated airplane or more complicated <laughs> mission. Yeah. Cool. You can fly the plane. Now let's kill people with it. Or, cool, you can fly the plane, now let's spy on people with it. Or, cool, you can fly the plane, let's refuel people with it, right? And flying should be, like, the baseline, and now we need to do mission tasks. So, yeah, flying is a game of task management. It's a game of knowing what to pay attention to, what to ignore, what to prioritize, when you need to put your eyes on just one thing, and when to step back and see the big picture, the forest and the trees. 
As you can imagine, the FAA, the military, NASA, the airlines, and a whole bunch of individual pilots, some of them smarter than others, have given this some thought since forever, since the Wright brothers, right? Uh, I found an FAA paper on this topic, and we'll link to it in the show notes. A couple suggestions that it had talked about common techniques for strategic task management. And I don't really totally understand how they divide strategic task management from tactical task management. Yeah, this is the FAA. This is the FAA. So like they want it to sound cool. Tactical. Okay. Okay, cool. Cost an extra 20% and it's brown. Um, <laughs> so what the FAA paper suggests among other things is plan and anticipate how the flight's going to go create a shared mental model and share it in the briefing. So don't let the plane take you somewhere your brain didn't already get to. That way you kind of know how things are going to go and you know when it's going to get busy and you know when I need everybody on their A game and when we can kind of chill out a little bit. And we've sorted most of that out on the ground in the briefing. Okay. Part of the briefing has to include task priorities for the next phase of flight. Hey, Okay, we're in the climb. What's going to matter when we're in cruise? Okay, we're in cruise. What's going to matter on the descent? Okay, we're on the descent. What's going to matter on landing? Okay, so what's going to matter next? You have to anticipate disruptions or threats and create contingency plans for their mitigation. What if we have weather at the airport we're going to land at? What are we going to do about it? Uh, What if we lose a motor? Well, if we lose a motor, this is my plan for what I'm going to do about that, right? Don't just let it surprise you. Plan and schedule tasks to perform at high and low workload periods of the flight. So, hey, when things are quiet, instead of playing Candy Crush, do something that's going to put you in an advantage in the next phase. Okay. Stay organized with charts and information flow so as not to become distracted. As in, back in the day, we flew with big paper maps, and you could end up with five feet of map in three feet of cockpit. And uh, literally, you would block your view of the gauges, sometimes opening up the maps. So the FAA goes on. They talk about tactical task management, which i still confused by. <laughs> Here we go. And it says interleave steps of two or more tasks into one task, like chunk your tasks. Okay, I can get behind that. Cool, cool. Um, Defer a task to a lower workload period. Hey, I'm busy. We'll get to that later. Well, I will tell you that's fine, but you got to remember to actually do it. Um, So we fly around with tablets now, right? Instead of all the paper charts and stuff. And anytime I defer a task, anytime I say I'm going to handle that later, or I'll check on that later, I put a timer up on my my tablet, so it'll start beeping in a couple of minutes. Uh, or <laughs> I'll go to like, uh, you draw with your finger on the tablet, I'll draw a dick on the tablet. <laughs> and so every <laughs> I time did, I look at how it... How did I know <laughs> you were going to go there? <laughs> it was going to be a dick. Uh, every time I look at it, I'm like, oh... There's a dick. I need to do something. It's just, it's sort of like, you know, wearing a rubber band on your wrist to remind you to do a thing or whatever. It's that that kind of thing. Uh, Suspend a task, switch to another task, and then resume your primary task. It's that changing channels thing, but do it deliberately. Okay, now I'm on this. Okay, now I'm on this. Dynamically reprioritize your task based on the context. Again, ask yourself, what matters right now? Okay, that was the checklist we were on, but now I have an engine fire. Hold that checklist. The game changed and yeah. adjust my prioritization accordingly. I think that's a that's a big one. Reprioritizing is big. Yeah. Uh, next option is drop a task and just don't do it. I call that the FAA's permission to say, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, we're not doing that. Um, use your automation to reduce your workload. And we'll talk about this a little bit as we go, but like a lot of automation, a lot of the graphic user interfaces that are meant to help you actually end up sucking away your attention as you're trying to like control, delete, reset them. Um, So only use them to the extent they reduce your workload would be my, my offer. And then be willing to say you're unable to an air traffic control request or ask for an extended vector or ask for holding 
recognize when you're assholes and elbows and you need to tell ATC like, no, we can't do that. Or, hey, we, we got our hands full up here. We need to go into holding and then we'll get resequenced in. So like know when to say when. I actually think that's really good advice. I think all of those were like good tactics and strategies from the FAA. So that's worth checking out. Now, as for tactical implications, and in our context, this is Jim and Mike talking tactical implications, so fighting (laughs) implications. Tactical for real. Yeah. So in my experience, one of the first skills most people lose when they're busy, when they're multitasking, is communication. Right? I can tell when a co-pilot is assholes and elbows uh, and getting task saturated while he's flying the plane because he gets real quiet. Or when he does talk, he talks like a cr- caveman. <laughs> just kind of they're out of breath. Me. That's what I, yeah. I hear. Like, like, and not because they're chasing somebody or actually fighting, but out of breath arbitrarily, right? Like, yeah. Uh, I noticed I lose the ability to be nice. I just sound really, really curt with people and they think I'm mad at them. I've been, I've been told that too. And you know, it's funny yeah. is like, people are like, oh, you just come across like an asshole. And one of my like old mentors in a conversation with someone else just said like, he's not being a dick. He's just all business. Yeah. And I was like, thanks. Like that actually, I felt like that summed it up. Well, like I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just focused on this thing, right? Like the thing that we're doing, whatever the mission is. The (laughs) other place I see this a lot is in terms of communication. And it's not so much that it's where people start to fall apart, but it's just a bad habit that people get into is like clearing houses. I'll see cops or SWAT guys. They're trying to communicate with like something that they're seeing or a direction they're going to go or something about the task of clearing the house. And they start talking with their hands and, and they take their hands off of their gun and they're pointing at stuff. And I'm like, I don't need you to point. I need you to keep two hands on the gun. Or instead of looking in the area of wherever a threat might be, they start looking over their shoulder and they're like, Hey, trying to make eye contact with whoever they're talking to. And it's like, you need to understand that like they're listening, watch the areas that you need to be paying attention to. It's another area that we see that multitasking and communication thing interplay. Uh, I've flown with one or two uh, people who I would describe as touch talkers. Like they reach over and touch you every time they talk (laughs) because they're like trying to build an, a human connection. And I'm like, I don't need to build a human connection right now. I need to land the plane. So one of the most important things you can do when you're getting busy and you you recognize that you're getting overwhelmed by the, by all the stuff that you're tracking is delegate. And you can delegate to someone who outranks you if you need to right? delegate. Uh, You may not be able to delegate responsibility or accountability, but maybe you can at least delegate attention. Hey Jones, I need you to watch that hallway. Hey Nav, I need you to watch our, our, our fuel burn going over the Atlantic, <laughs> like do the thing, right? It's a pro, uh, pro tip. Yeah. And recognize when you need to drop tasks, when you need to say, nope, nope, uh, this is just not getting done. I'm going to drop this ball while I'm juggling and that's okay. Uh, speaking of dropping balls, I need you to recognize when you need to drop objects. Humans have this very strong ape impulse to hang on to anything in their hands especially when they're under stress. They like grip them tighter. Uh, John Correa of Active Self-Protection, we've talked to him on the on the podcast before. He does a great job explaining how common and how strong this is. If you ever want to deep dive that, find Active Self-Protection. Uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I want to re-stomp it. Recognize when automation is hurting you. If you're spending all your attention uh, looking at or dealing with a graphic interface, Uh, and trying to tell it what to do, or you're letting it tell you what to do, you're not using the automation to your advantage. And whatever that interface is, it might be your phone, it might be your uh, ATAC tablet, it might be your, you know, uh, the, the flight management navigation computer on your airplane, whatever it is, only use it to the extent that it's helping you. And Sometimes it takes talking to the folks who run this, the software to change settings and defaults so that you're not spending all your attention telling it to do the same things over and over and over. 
Uh, and sometimes it's as simple as look away from the screen. Where you put, point your eyeballs is a big part of this game. So at, at the end of the day, when it comes to attention and perception stuff, and I think we mo- mostly focus on like the focus and attention, but I think perception plays well into this and, and maybe there's a good follow-up to be done here. One of the things that we need to understand in terms of where we're going with this and, and takeaways is we can't fix all of it. There, there are training implications, right? There are takeaways in terms of like how we can compensate for it. But at the end of the day, this is just human nature. Oh, uh, that's actually a good point. Can I, can I train a guy to multitask? You can train his 80% to be better than someone a little, else's 90, right? Like, right? But I can like, get him, I can get him used to it. Right. Uh, but I can, what you're really doing is you're teaching him how to, where he, where he can mitigate, right? Like what sacrifices can be made? That's the question, right? If I'm walking up on a traffic stop and I'm looking for guns, dope, open containers, how many people in the car, that's a lot of things to pay attention to. When all I should care about are hands. On the way up to the car, all I care about are hands. I'm not looking for guns and dope and open containers and all that at on the approach. That's not the important thing right then, right? And so what I need guys to be cognizant of is that right? is that like i i'm not going to be able to focus on all that at once if i know for a fact that going into this i can only focus on one real thing or only multitask two real things on some level i need to make sure that i choose well like choose wisely right so we can't really fix it we condition we can condition our behavior a little bit we can shape our decision making favorably in light of those things and make sure that we are setting ourselves up for success in that sense. Uh, Jim talked about the dropping stuff. This is a really common thing. We've been doing this a lot in canine because we go out and search with the dog and we have a flashlight in one hand. And we've seen handlers a lot of times when a lethal threat presents itself, they'll either hold onto the leash and draw their gun or they'll drop the leash, but they'll hold another flashlight and draw the gun. And a lot of time, like you see a lot of body worn camera, John Korea absolutely does a lot of these where guys will hold onto their notepad or their pen when they draw their gun. You can do drills that make it a habit to get rid of that stuff and go to the gun, right? You can make that a habit and not something that you have to think about explicitly. Like I said, we want to know and, and understand that if we're going to be blind to certain things that we're choosing what things we're going to be focused on, right? If we're going to selective attention is fine as long as we select the right things and dividing attention, sharing the workload in team settings. Jim talked about delegating, Hey, so-and-so watch the hallway, right? Or Hey, navigator do X, Y, and Z. That's a great way to share the workload and make sure that in a team setting, we're splitting stuff up. And sometimes you need to notice, like, is this an area where I want redundancy? Or do I want checks and balances to make sure that something doesn't get overlooked, right? If that um, alarm is going off that only the engineer can see, but he's down looking at the landing gear, can anyone else see it? That's like a a, a sort of redundancy area where I want to make sure, like, that's not relying on just one person in some cases. And another thing is, At the end of the day, just making sure that we're accountable, not only to each other, but to ourselves, and that we're not stuck in this pattern or routine or always engaged in a problem in such a way that it leads to complacency, right? We're stuck in this, like, this is the only way to, it's very rigid. This is how we handle this. This is how we fly the plane. This is what I always stare at. I don't scan my instruments you know, or I don't look over my shoulder or I don't check that corner, right? We want to make sure that we are constantly engaged in the problem. And this is where, you know, Jim talks about like automation and technology. It's a good area where like this, this can help speed things up for us. It can simplify a lot of things, but we have to make sure that we give the appropriate amount of credit to how well those, how reliable those things are and what happens when they fail right? Making sure that we acknowledge and account for those sorts of things and giving them the weight that they deserve and no more, no more, no less, right? Uh, Is something that you just need to be thoughtful about before the crisis. 
And at the end of the day, that's that's what all of this is about, is understanding that humans are fallible, right? Pilot error is a thing, human error is a thing, and making sure that we are learning from our mistakes along the way and setting up our training so that we're successful in the future. Uh, one thing I want to hit is the the concept of compartmentalization. I think that's a matter of pride for a lot of uh, a lot of people in the communities uh, that you know they can leave work at work and leave home at home. And it's easy to say that, but honestly, I see bleed over all the time in a lot of the people I work with and myself. Um, I think the key is to know when uh, when you are past the limit or when a coworker is past the limit. And it's also sometimes helpful to like remind people, Hey, Hey, we need to lock it up. We got a thing going on. Um, Hey, we're in a critical phase of flight. Maybe we don't need to be talking about this right now. Um, and it kind of sucks to have to be the like hall monitor on that stuff. And everyone should be professional enough to recognize and read the room when, Hey, we're busy. We're task saturated. Uh, but we don't live in a perfect world and we're humans. And sometimes humans forget where they are. And what matters right that second, sometimes they need to be reminded. Uh, similarly, with focus, I think that we, as a society, we, we value focus. Someone who can be laser focused on whatever the task or goal is. Focus is important. Like, you have to know when to really sink all your attention to something. But one of the things we're talking about here is, like, Part of good focus is kind of breaking it up sometimes. Yeah, yes, f- look at the runway, but then kind of back off and kind of assess the wider situation. And channelize the tension is sometimes the very thing that will hose you, right? If you're putting all of your attention on that landing gear issue and you don't notice your altitude, you're going to meet the ground, which literally happened in that Eastern Air Flight. So I think that's all I got. This is this is intended mostly just to kind of get you thinking about what you spend your attention on and how you spend it, how you divide it, how you recognize when you are overwhelmed and what to do about it. I wish I had a good answer for you on like how to do all the things all at once. Um, I think recognizing that you're probably not as good as you think you are is helpful. I think being able to recognize in the person next to you when they are overwhelmed is helpful. Uh, and I'm, I think that's all I got. Mike, what you got? I, I just want to go back to really understanding that like this stuff, we think we are not as fallible as we are. Like, that DRM paradigm thing, I've run, I've run like a little miniature version of that in classes that I've taught, and people are like, the word sleep is on there. And I'm like, no, it's not. Like, I've seen it. And if you think about it, like all those times that you see a body-worn camera video, and after the, fa- after the fact, an officer says, this is what happened, and you watch, like, roll the tape. It's like, well, that's not, that's not what happened. <laughs> that's what you perceive to happen. And the thing is, is it doesn't mean that you're lying. It doesn't mean that you fabricated anything or that you're a bad person. It's just to illustrate that human perception and memory and attention is fallible. And we have to accommodate those. Like our training has to accommodate for that. Our judgment, not only our judgment in the moment, right? Like decision-making in general, but our judgment when we look back at stuff and we debrief things, and we try to learn from things needs to accommodate for that. And you got to weigh into it, right? Like understand that your training needs to compensate for that. This is one of the things when we talk about like de-escalation training and I say, Hey, you don't learn that in front of a PowerPoint. It's because first you have to make the, am I safe decision before you get into the, can I slow this down? Right. It's a different side of the brain. It's a different mechanism at play when you start doing that stuff. And so Make sure that you give it due credit as you process through how you apply this in your reality. That's all I got. Be safe out there. Be smart out there. I feel like what we're doing. uh, Tell tell a friend about us. That is honestly one of the best ways you can help us is is help us get the word out. Uh, That includes get us a rating on whatever podcast app you're using. 
uh, and that can help us reach more like-minded people and help spread the good word. That's all I got. Cheers. All right, guys, that's all we got for tonight. This episode is brought to you by Drip Drop. Drip Drop Oral Rehydration Solution is an electrolyte powder that you mix with water. It was formulated by a doctor for quick absorption. I work in the desert, and it only takes a few hours in the heat, wearing body armor, carrying around a bunch of gear before I start feeling like crap and fall behind the curve in dehydration. Drip Drop keeps you in the fight so you can finish the mission and rehab for the next one. Go get you some at dripdrop.com or on Amazon or ask your supply guy to find it for you. This episode is also brought to you by Zero Nine Holsters. We talk a lot about people, ideas, and hardware on this show. So when we invest in equipment, we always think in terms of experience first. Zero Nine is helping you figure out how to carry the gear you need to be effective. They are built by cops for cops with a minimalist design and bomb-proof durability. Radio cases, flashlights, body cameras, even canine remotes, you name it. Zero Nine has been filling a void in tactical duty holsters for more than a decade. Go see what they offer at Zero Nine Holsters. That's Z-E-R-O, the number nine, holsters.com. Zero Nine, built to win the fight. Don't forget that we put out new episodes on the 1st and the 15th of every month. If you like what we're doing, you can have a Patreon, give us a buck for each new episode. That money's going to go back into bringing you good content. If you want to interact with us, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are at TacTangents. You can also email info at tacticaltangents.com. And one last thing, our uh, Facebook discussion group. We've got a little group going on Facebook. If you go to the groups tab on our page, you can join it. Um, We've got more followers on our page than we have in the group so i know there's some of you out there following the facebook page that are on facebook that are not in the group lots of like-minded people in there uh so come hang out with us Uh, all right that's all we got good talk